who's hot and who's not? It depends. Feminine beauty is an almost entirely cultural concept. It's ever-changing, and we're about to explore its history. 5,000 years of smooth skin, voluptuous hair, and soft curves. You in? For most of history, what was considered the pinnacle of sensuality was... Nah, not this. That. A woman's hair is like an erotic hand grenade. It can blow up and unleash horniness at any moment. Everybody knows it. And most religions knew it too. That's why they've always tried to hide the dangerous hair. Take a look at what Clement of Alexandria, a Christian theologian, wrote in the 2nd century AD. And the very same concept also exists in Judaism and Islam. In the Western world, beauty has historically been associated with blonde hair. Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty, was often described as golden-haired, and so was Helen of Troy. In medieval artwork, Isolde, Eve, Mary Magdalene, and the Virgin Mary are often portrayed with blonde hair too. And there's a simple explanation to this yellow obsession. Scarcity. It is estimated that blonde people only account to 2% of the world population. And scarcity makes everything desirable. And along the much desired blonde hair, a second feature has also always been very coveted. Pale skin. From Ovid's poems in ancient Rome to the Middle Ages literature, it's hard to escape the references to snow white, marble, or milky skin linked with feminine beauty. But unlike blonde hair, white skin isn't genetically rare in most of Europe and Asia. It's something else. Up until very recently, most people spend their days working in the fields under the sun, so being tan was associated with being poor. Pale skin, on the other hand, was a clear indication of high social status. And this can be traced as far back as ancient Greece in Europe, the Han Dynasty in China, or the Nera period in Japan. Of course, most people didn't naturally possess this translucent white color that was so hype at the time, and they had to resort to all sorts of tricks to lighten their skin. Ovid, for example, recommended that Roman women apply crocodile poop on their faces. Most places didn't enjoy an easy access to crocodile excrements, however, and lead-based cosmetics have been the preferred whiteners since ancient times. And the results were great. Look at this white! There's a catch though. Lead's a heavy metal, we use it to make car batteries and ammunition. It's not a sweet good smelling plant like aloe vera. As you can guess, the people who applied lead on their faces every day did end up suffering a few disturbances like hell loss or death. No pain, no gain! And then, the Industrial Revolution completely changed the social distribution of sunlight. Now the poor were the one locked inside a factory all day, while the rich enjoyed picnics and boat trips and displayed a beautiful tan. The Snow White hype quickly disappeared in Europe, but it still goes on in Asia though, where skin whitening is a growing multi-billion dollar industry. Anyway, if a woman's skin and hair can hypnotize the eye, her figure is what has historically kept guys awake at night, writing cheesy metaphors. Just like this Egyptian love poem, rescued from a 3,000 years old papyrus. She's one girl, there's no one like her. Heavy thighs, narrow waist, her legs, parade her beauty. That's how the ancient Egyptians liked their women. Thin and very, very long-legged. And the ancient Greeks would certainly disagree, mainly because their idea of beauty revolved around having disproportionate pecs and a very proportionate penis. Yeah. Feminine beauty clearly wasn't their priority. However, they did make a few naked representations of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. She always appears thin, with a little belly, large hips, and medium breasts. When it came to women, the ancient Greeks swore by the pear shape. And then came the Romans, and they had this Chinese car manufacturer mentality. So they basically took everything the Greeks ever invented and just copied it the gods, the architecture, and the taste for women. The rather explicit wall paintings found in Roman villas or brothels all celebrate the pear shape. And then, Christianity took over the Western world, which clearly changed the whole vibe as far as celebrating the body was concerned. 
the human body was now officially considered a disgusting amount of decaying flesh, which is why it's impossible to find a naked body in early Middle Ages art. By the late medieval period though, female nudes started to resurface, especially in the illuminated manuscripts. These were private books, so there was no risk of uncontrolled TD exposure to the general population, which is why it was tolerated by the church. At that time, by the way, the peak of sexiness was still a combination of blonde hair, cadaveric skin and a beautiful pear shape. In the mid-15th century, Europe launched a big update. The Renaissance! During this time, the classic Greco-Roman culture was rediscovered and logically, the nude made a huge comeback in arts. The body was praised again as something beautiful and full of life. In the paintings of Raphael, Titian or Rubens, women proudly exhibit large hips. And to celebrate his dedication to love handles, chubby girls have officially retired Rubens' jersey. And the adjective Rubenesque can now be used to describe a woman with beautiful curves. But the hype around extra flesh didn't last long. The 18th century marked a return to a thinner figure and a traditional pear shape. With an important change though. Europe officially entered the boobs era. With friends leading the way, necklines were lowered. Pretty low, actually. At the time, displaying a bare ankle or shoulder was considered highly inappropriate, but showing off your cleavage was just fine. Of course, with such a freedom of movement, it wasn't uncommon to see your breast casually pop out of the dress. To face this situation with the greatest elegance, before going out into the world, upper-class ladies made sure to put red makeup on their nipples. Fashion comes and goes, and in the following century, breasts were covered again. And not only that, the 19th century saw the official death of the pear shape, because the hourglass killed it. The early 1800s is when the glorification of large breasts and buttocks, together with a tiny waist, really took off. Of course, very few girls had the genetics to achieve this brand new ideal. And there was no plastic surgery nor photoshop at the time, so women had to use that. A corset. It had rigid parts that made both the breasts and the buttocks look bigger. And the central part was laced very tight in order to make the waist look as narrow as possible. And it worked. But at what cost? The corset basically made a sushi roll with all the internal organs, the kidneys, the stomach, the liver, they ended up all over the place. The 19th century also saw a massive expansion of the printed world. All these brand new women's magazines displayed a standardized beauty ideal. And that increased the pressure on women to always be thinner. Logically, the first ads for weight loss products were published in these very same magazines. Soaps, powders, rubbers, everything was good to lose weight. The weirdest idea of all is probably this one though. The tapeworm diet. People swallowed a pill with a tapeworm egg inside, hoping it would consume all the extra calories. Of course, the tapeworm had to be removed someday, which wasn't the most pleasant part of the process. A few places, however, rejected the tyranny of the scale and skinny shamed everybody, even 200 pounds women. And that's because for centuries, food had been scarce for the nomadic people living in the Sahara Desert. In this context, being fat was a sign of wealth, and many young girls were force-fed to the extreme by their families in order to increase their chances of marriage. This tradition, called Le Bleu, has been rooted in the Tuareg culture since the 11th century and has been followed in many rural areas of northern and western Africa. Nowadays, however, it is quickly losing ground. And so the 20th century mainly embraced the hourglass figure. It went global thanks to the Hollywood movies of the 1950s and 60s. In the late 70s, after decades of trial and error, surgeons finally figured out the breast enlargement procedure. And an army of zeppelin tits took over the West. Until a number of class actions against breast implant manufacturers put an end to the hype of the superhuman boobs. But only to switch focus to another body part. Buttocks! And the hourglass has now been reshaped into a flower vase. So it's all very nice, and as science progresses, women may try to fit into newer, more extreme shapes. But it seems that something important has been forgotten here. You see, it's all visual nowadays, screens everywhere and photoshop bodies on every single one of them. What about the smell? 
the sound of the voice. These features have always been very present in the love poems since ancient times, and science has shown that they are strongly connected with sexual attraction. So it might be a good idea sometimes to stop being so obsessed by what our eyes see and start using our five senses to enjoy beauty.